verse 13. It says this, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And look at what they replied with. They said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus says, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by, the, by my Father in heaven. And I'll tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Come on, let's pray. Father, we're grateful and we're thankful for this moment. God, thank you for this time, this space that we get to share together. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to uh, ask for your presence because you're omnipresent, meaning that your presence is everywhere. But Lord, what we are asking is to make us aware of your presence. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for this moment. God, we ask that you speak to us. Give us eyes to see what it is that you're showing us, ears to hear what you're saying. And Lord, I pray. God, that you would speak through me, Lord, that every word of mine will fall flat, but may only what you would have me to say would penetrate our hearts for change, transformation. God, we love you, and we honor you. It's in Jesus' name. Everybody said, come on, come on. Everybody said, amen and amen. Family, have you ever been in a situation where you were in search of information regarding anything that you were, whatever it is you were looking for, but you only found conflicting information, conflicting ideas, conflicting approaches. For instance, in our backyard, I noticed that as the, the grass was coming out of dormancy, late spring, early summer, I, I noticed that some of the, the some patches uh, were, were dead patches, that they were green like the rest of the grass was turning green. And so I started to do some research. I started to ask around because I had some questions. I needed some help because I don't know about you, but, you know, you can, I'm not saying there's an obsession, but I like for the grass to be green if you understand what I'm saying. And so I started to call around and, 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 and do some, some Google searches. And one thing I, I noticed and discovered was I was getting different answers. So one space would say, hey, Here's what you need to do. You need to water the grass at this time. Then here was another, another source says, no, 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 no. Actually, water it later in the day. I'm like, okay, well, which one is it? Then I get another one that says, use this type of fertilizer. Okay. Well, then I go to another source, and it says, don't use that type of fertilizer, but use this type of fertilizer. I'm conflicted. I'm confused. I'm realizing that everyone has an idea, everyone has an opinion on how to get these dead spots in my grass green. Can I tell you, family, it's true in the same way when it comes to the church and what the church is supposed to be. And when I say the church, I'm not referring to the becoming church, but rather the capital C church, the greater church. What is it supposed to be? And hear me, everyone has an opinion to that question. The TikTok theologians have an opinion. The former pastors turned podcasters have an opinion. Politicians have an opinion. Your cousin has an opinion. Your auntie, too. They have an opinion. And if we're honest, you have an opinion. I have an opinion. We all have opinions, and it's those opinions and ideology that is shaping our theology and worldview. So as I pray for this conversation today, I felt like we needed to walk away being able to answer these two questions. What is church and what is my response to it? And I think the best way uh, to answer that is found in the title of today's message, which is this, what did Jesus say? So we want to answer what is the church. I think the answer is what did Jesus say? Matter of fact, can you help me out? Would you turn to your neighbor and say, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? Some of you here for the first time was like, man, I thought they weren't going to ask me to do that. <laughs> so here in our text, family, Jesus, he's asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? 
This is Jesus' way of saying, listen, hey, Ted, I want to know what are the streets saying? I want to know what, what is TikTok saying? What is your cousin saying? What is homeboy down the street saying? Who are people saying? What are people saying that I am? And look at here in Matthew 16, verse 14. This is what they say to the question. Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, to give a little context to that, you may say, well, why John the Baptist? Well, John was known as the forerunner, the, the one who came before Jesus saying, prepare the way of the Lord. He pointed to Jesus. In terms of Elijah, well, there was this, this prophecy, and actually you can find it in, in Malachi, that Elijah would, would return one day. See, Elijah and Enoch in Scripture are the only two people that never died. The Lord simply took them. And so there's this prophecy that says, well, Elijah's going to return. And so they think, well, perhaps Jesus, well, perhaps he's Elijah. Now, there was no prophecy regarding Jeremiah, but what people were noticing, it was like, yo, Jeremiah had a lot of passion, and he had a lot of, of this, 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 this fire uh, within him, and, and he had such disdain for uh, the religious rulers of the day and their corruption. And here it is, Jesus, he looks a lot like Jeremiah. There's a lot of passion he has. Think about in the temple uh, where he's uh, chasing out the money changers with the whip. We're going to call that passion. He was passionate. So they're like, well, maybe this is Jeremiah. And so Jesus says, okay, that's cool. The streets is watching. I'm hearing. Okay, got it. But what about you? Who do you say I am? Family, I think that's a question right there that you and I should wrestle with today. Because everyone, we, we may be aware of what everyone else's opinion and idea of who Jesus is. But I think it's important to stop and pause and, and, and analyze that question up for ourselves. Who do I say that Jesus is? And it's important to do that because the way we see God will determine our response to him. And so if we, if we see God as this big guy in the sky sitting on this throne who is just simply waiting for the moment for us to make up, wake, uh, to mess up so he can say, listen, I got you. I caught you. There it is. You missed the mark. To hell you go. And can I tell you, we have the wrong framework in the picture of who God is. And so it's important for us to be able to answer that question, to have the right perspective to see, no, this is God who so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is the God who saw you in your mess, picked you up out of it, and created a message. This is the God that when you were sick, he healed your body. This is the God that while your marriage was on the rock, he restored it. This is the God that is giving you peace in the middle of chaos. This is the God that has given you joy when you see you can't find joy. This is the God that will give you hope in hopeless situations. And I don't know if I got anyone else in here who has discovered the God that I'm talking about that is full of joy, of love, of peace, and mercy. If you have discovered him, can we just pause for the cause and give him some praise that God, I know who you are. I don't have to go to TikTok. I don't have to go to Instagram. I don't have to go to my cousin, Pookie, Ray Ray, and Neil because I got a story and a testimony of who Jesus is because I saw my life and he picked me up and he turned me around. It ain't just got to be a song for Maverick City, but it's a song for Michael Hamilton that he placed my feet on a solid ground. And now I got a story to tell of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Who do you say I am? Because I may not be able to get you on all the theological points, but you can't tell me how he healed me. You can't debate me on how he set me free. You can't tell me how he has placed me in a place that I shouldn't be. It's the power of your story, your testimony. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, the word of what Jesus has done. So it's an important question to answer, but who do you say that I am? <sighs> Spent too much time there. Look at A.W. Tozer. He says this, what comes into your minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And it is because if what you think about him is not framed in the right perspective of who he is, then family, we won't be positioned to receive what he has for us. 
You know, we, we talk about this, this, this scripture often, that great are you, Lord, and you are greatly to be praised. And you've heard me say that, that you can only praise God at the level of revelation that you have of who he is. And so if you only know him to be okay, then guess what? You're going to give him an okay praise. And so the team is up here, and they lead us in worship, and they pour our heart, and, they, and we like, <sighs> because maybe we only just know him to be okay. Maybe we just only know him to be so-so. But when you have this revelation of his goodness, of his greatness, and you realize the mess that you was, the mess that we are, and how the Lord has still chosen to stay beside us, to pick us up, to be with us, to show us and give us a glimpse, a future of what could be, then you realize that I have no choice but to lift my hands. I have no choice but to open my mouth. I have no choice but to give him praise. I have no choice but to give him my worship. Because I've realized who he is. Yeah, cool. Whatever he is to you, that's cool. But I know who he is to me. So that may be your story, but this is my story. That may be your situation, but this is my situation. So we got to be able to answer that question. And look at what Peter says. He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And Jesus goes on to say, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So right here, family, we see something unique. We see something profound. We see something that at this point we have not discovered before just yet. We see that Jesus makes a connection with his identity and his mission. So, you know, John the Baptist was the one that was saying, hey, prepare the way of the Lord. He's the Messiah. You know, Jesus, he steps in, and he's in a synagogue, and he picks up the scroll of Isaiah, and he begins to read it, saying, like, this day has just happened. But now he says this, that I will build my church. So a connection has been made with his identity and his mission. See, Christ wasn't his last name. Christ means anointed one. It means chosen one that he is the one that the Old Testament prophets is specifically Isaiah prophesied about, that the Messiah, the Savior of the world is coming. And so now we know that that is Jesus, but now he makes this connection between his identity and his mission. What is his mission? To build his church. But what does Jesus mean by that? What does he mean, I will build my church? Is he talking buildings? Is he talking structures? Is he talking programs? Is he talking systems? Is he talking platforms? What does it mean when he says, I will build my church? Well, let's look at, let's let's define it by looking at what the word church means. And before we do that, remember, we're answering two questions today. What is church and what is my response to it? So we're building towards that. So the Greek word for church is ekklesia, and it means a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place or assembly. Now, this isn't a, a religious term. This was actually a political term. It could be used in multiple ways and facets. So this wasn't exclusive to the way that Jesus was using it. So uh, the, the Romans will often use this term, ecclesia, to call the citizens out from their homes for a different purpose. So and let's look further at the word. The word is a compound of two segments. So ek, meaning out of, and then the verb kaleo, signifying to call. So that's how we get to call out. So ekklesia means a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into a public place or an assembly. So we, the church, we are a called out people. But I want us to look further into that by making some observations to answer the question, what is church? And here is the first answer. The first answer is this. Our observation is this. Church is a people. Church is a people. So if ecclesia means a gathering or an assembly, it means that we step out of one thing to step into another thing. So think back to high school or maybe even high school right now, whenever there was an assembly, a pep rally, whatever it was, you stepped out of the classroom and you stepped into the gym or into the auditorium for a greater 
purpose. So the idea family of gathering says, listen, pause whatever it is that you are doing and come participate in what we are doing. And you got to see where I'm tracking with. Here's the beautiful thing about this when it comes to the we. We isn't a set, determined group of people, but rather we are those who are willing to participate. It's those who are willing to say, I'm stepping out what if I'm, I'm doing to step into what we are doing, to be a part of the collective. And listen, this is what it means to be part of the church, that I'm stepping out of the life of what I am doing and my care and my concerns and what I got on, bless you and yours and all of that. And it's saying, no, I'm being brought into a gathering of people to see what we could do together. And I just wonder if we have that same heart, that same mind, that same position at the Becoming Church to say, Lord, I want to step out of just what I'm doing in my circle, in my box, and step together to what we are doing to say this, to have this sentiment. What can the Lord do with us? What can the Lord do through us? How can we shake a city? How can we shake this state? How can we shake this nation? Listen, if you don't know, but there is big vision here at the church. It's not to just gather together and go kumbaya, but it is to make a difference in this city and beyond. It's that, I, this is my prayer, Lord, I want people to know that the Becoming Church exists. And if we wasn't here, it would be felt you got to do something in order for that to happen. You got to make a difference in order for that to happen. And can I tell you, it can't take one, two, three, four, five, but it's going to take the collective, the people who are willing to say, I'm stepping out of just what concerns me to be a part of the we. And the we is not a set, determined group of people. It's those who are willing to participate. And can I tell you, you say, I don't have anything to offer. Nope, I, I'm going to disagree. I'm going to push back. Everything that you need to fulfill the call of God in your life, can I tell you, it's already in your hands. All we have to do is to step out in faith and let God use us. If he can take two fish and follow us of bread and feed thousands, it, it, it takes away. Oh, I don't have it all. I don't have it together. I don't have it. Can I tell you there's an advantage in your disadvantage? You may say, oh, I'm disadvantaged here. No, look for the advantage there. Look for how you're wired. Look for what you can see. Because innovative and creativity doesn't come about because of excess. It comes about because of lack. It comes about because there's not enough. It comes about because we don't have all that we need. So there's actually an advantage in the disadvantage. It just takes people who are willing to say, Lord, if you do anything in Huntsville, if you do anything in Madison, am I talking to anybody? If you do anything in Alabama, if you do anything in the United States of America and beyond, use me, use we. Let's change our language from me to we, to be a part of the collective, it's a people. That's why we say we don't go to church, but we gather as the church. Who is the church? It's you. It's you. It's me. It's us. We are the church. It's not a building. In fact, we know that well, better than other churches. Why? Because it's James Clemens High School. There's not even a sign that says to become a church up on it. You passed one, but it was portable. If the wind didn't blow it away, this is our tabernacle. We don't have the temple. And we've been tabernacling <laughs> in multiple places, from Stove House to the Jackson Center to Preservation Company to Horizon Elementary to now here at James Clemens. Listen, the church is not a building. Now, don't get it twisted. We're praying for, for those. <laughs> don't get it twisted. But when that happens, that ain't it. That's not the finish line. Can I tell you what that will become? A tool. Because that's all it is. It's a tool to facilitate ministry. But it's not the end-all, be-all. We won't go, oh, we made it. We, we grown up now. No. That's just the beginning of more. Beginning of more reach. Beginning of more mission. Beginning of more seeing people belong to community, believe in Jesus, and become who God designed them to become. To see people united to purpose. It's just seeing more of that become a reality. So we don't go to church, but we gather as a church because 
Church is a people. Now, with that being said, I do have to say this. There's been this growing sentiment over the last few years of people who say, hey, I'm cool with church, excuse me, I'm cool with Jesus, but not as church. And listen, I understand the sentiment because as we look across the landscape of Christianity and the church, we can see that so many of us, so many people have been hurt by the church, abused by the church, mistreated by the church to the point that it's easy to, to say, you know what, give me Jesus, but keep the church. So no, we're not going to stand here today and dismiss the fact that the church is perfect, but I will also say, if you look for a perfect church, good luck, because you're not going to find it, because every church is full of imperfect people, because that's who we are. The only perfect one is the Holy One, who is Jesus, and he gives us this opportunity of sanctification to go on a journey of becoming like him, but Philippians 1.6 reminds us that that won't happen until the day of Christ Jesus, so we know we're still becoming in this journey. So you're not going to find the perfect church because that would mean the people would be perfect and that's just not going to be the case. But I do want to make sure I acknowledge that the church has made mistakes, that the church has issues. And I know that people who say they love Jesus can also be the people who don't look like Jesus the most. <laughs> look at some of the comments that come on, 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 on some of the stuff that we post. Why you need another church? You know, it's like, oh, they're Christian when you look at the profile. Okay, bless Jesus. Clearly, you don't get it, but bless them in the name of Jesus. But can I tell you, while all that is true, church hurt is real and all those things, can I tell you, that doesn't change the fact that we can't separate Jesus and the church. And I say that lovingly, but it doesn't change the fact that you can't separate Jesus and the church. Colossians 1.8 says this, he, talking about Jesus, is the head of the body, which is the church. I don't know about you, but we can't separate the head from the body, and then expect the body to function in the same way. So it's true, family, with church. You can't separate Jesus from his church because he is the head of the church. So it's, it's impossible. You can't do it. He says, I will build my church, and we are the body of Christ. He is the head of his church, so you can't separate the two. So, so look at this. E even this, even, I'll say this first, even this. So the church is, is the bride of Christ. Can you imagine how it looks like, you know, you say to somebody like, hey, we cool. Or maybe I'll use me. You come to me and you say, hey, man, you cool. But Katie, your wife, can't stand her. I'm going to say, you're going to have to go ahead and duck right now. I'm just going just to be honest with you. So how does that even sound to me? Oh, you cool, but I don't like your wife. So we say, Jesus, you cool, but... Your bride, the church, ah, that's not honored. That's not, that's not, that's not, and I, and I get it. I, I, I get, I get it. I'm not dismissing those things that I mentioned earlier. And, I'll, and I'm going to speak to that here in just, just a moment as I keep going. So, so, so picture this. So we have all been to a restaurant where it took forever to get in. Once you got in, you realized just how bad the customer service was you like, you know I didn't have to come here, right? You know, I'm not, you know, you're not helping me out. Anyway, I don't have that experience recently. <laughs> but, but you show up and it took a while to get in and, 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 and the service was, was bad and, and then it took a while to get your food and you even did this. You start, I know they didn't get their plate before. We can sit down. Don't act like you didn't do it. Don't act like you didn't do it. <laughs> Food came out, took forever, and then when it got there, the order was wrong. You said medium well. It was medium rare. It just was a bad experience. Or you went through the drive-thru, whatever it was. You know what happened? We don't go, I'm done with all restaurants. I'm not eating out no more. I'm only cooking from home, eating at home from now on. No, you didn't know nobody said that. I'm gonna have a hard time believing anybody who's like, no, Pastor, that was me. No, it wasn't. You didn't give up on all restaurants. You just went to another restaurant. Or what about some for some of us, it's not even about restaurants in general. Maybe it was just that particular chain, that particular restaurant. So you said, oh, well, if that restaurant, I know they got one across the town, so I'm gonna go to that one. I don't like the one on this street, but I like the one on the other street. 
You didn't give up on it. You kept going. And it's the same with church family, that we can't take the behavior of a church and make it consistent across the church. If you had an experience that wasn't life-giving, okay, maybe the Lord is saying, that's not the local body of believers that I've called you to, but go find another one and get connected, and get planted, and begin to serve, and see your life become bigger. So get involved. And I believe this, that church is the place that can heal the hurt it caused. I believe that church is one of the only few places, if others, that that can heal the hurt it caused. It may not be the same local body, but it may be a different local body that will heal the, the hurt that you experience. So listen. I don't want to be self-serving here, and maybe you feel like this whole message is. It's not. But hear this. Get involved in a church. And, yeah, I'm not going to hide it. I think this is a really good one. If you thought I was involved, I wasn't. I think this is a really good one to get involved in. It's growing. It's healthy. It has vision. But listen, we aren't the only ones. Jesus is building his church. So we're not the only ones. So if this isn't it. If you like, I don't know, he yelled a little bit too much. You know, that's cool. There are churches that will speak to you very calmly and always in a state. Go find there. Whatever. You, you get my point, right? Get connected in a local church that is teaching the word of God, that is helping you to grow in your faith and fellowship of Jesus. you like, I don't know where to go. Well, send an email to hello at the church.org. We'll send you a list, but get connected. Because hear me. You are a Christian by yourself, but you are not the church by yourself. You're not. I had church. No, you had a good time. You are a Christian, you are a Christian by yourself, but you're not the church by yourself. Why? Because it's a team sport. And guess what? Our team is the church. That was way too much time on that. Church is a people. Here's a second observation. Church is a community. You guys all right? Y'all tracking with me? All right, so what I love about the church is it's not a place that you go to, but it's a community that we belong to. And I love that as we look around this community, I just see a group of people who are gathering with their stories, with their differences, with their backgrounds, but yet united under one cause, which is the name of Jesus. There's so much beauty in that. But with that said, here's something that we have to be careful of. We have to be careful that we don't mistake proximity for community. Because it's easy to think that just because our proximity is close, that community is happening, that community is taking place. And here's what I mean. Perhaps you have a coworker that you guys are tight, you guys are cool, and you, know, you kick it and, and all that stuff at work. And what about they found this new job, they got a promotion, and it's not with the company anymore, it's with a completely different company. Let me ask you this, when the last time y'all caught up? It's been a minute, huh? Because it was proximity that was happening, it wasn't necessarily community. So proximity doesn't make community. You know what it does? Intentionality does. So how are we being intentional within the gathering? How are, we, how are we being intentional with how we live together? Because true community is developed through authentic relationship, which requires us to be intentional and meaningful in our actions. So look at Acts 242, or I'll just kind of speak to it, actually. So in Acts 2, we see the beginning of the, the early church, so that the Holy Spirit has come, and, and now the church uh, has, has been birthed. And it talks about in Acts 242 of how the early church was devoted to fellowship. And, and the Greek word for, sh- for fellowship, it means sharing in common, right? So there was communion that was happening. Or you could say it this way, to share your life with others. So here's a question I have for us today. Who are we sharing our life with? Who are you sharing your life with? Who knows you? No, 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 no. I'm talking about for real, for real. Like when when you start talking a certain way, when you start using a certain cadence, when when your voice kind of reaches a certain pitch and they know, "Mm, nope, something's going on right there. Who knows you like that? And if it's hard for you to say anyone, family, you got to share your life. I'm not saying with anyone, but with someone. Because when you share your life with others, it's going to be people who knows what's going on with you, that you can call and celebrate with, somebody that you can call and cry with. 
Like, you have to, we have to be able to move from Sunday as being the only expression of community. And you got to be intentional in those moments. I've been having so many of, of those kind of conversations recently with people that I know, like, hey, I'm just making sure we're on the same page. Are you on this page? Because I'm on this page, and now I know what to expect, and now you know what to expect from me. So if I'm tripping, you tell me, and if you're tripping, I'm going to tell you. Because I, I, I can't. I can't do it by myself. I can't, I can't do it alone. And so I have given them the space and the authority to tell me you're tripping. But I have to be open and responsive to it. So it's cool to give them the authority, but I have to actually allow them to be active in it. And so this happened recently where I was talking to a friend. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. And, and they need to do it. He's like, no, actually, you need to. I said, oh, okay. And he was like, well, I said, no, 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 no. That's what you're supposed to say to me. And because he said that, I've been, I have been able to reflect and think and pray and then respond in the right way in that situation in which he was counseling me through. But if I didn't share my life, I would not have gotten that. I wouldn't have been able to receive that. So who are you sharing your life with? Because listen, it's great what happens in here on Sundays. Cool. Revelation happens in, on Sundays. But guess what? It's life transformation that happens throughout the week. And I just think if we get Monday through sun, Saturday right, that it will enhance what takes place when we gather in here on Sunday because now this becomes an expression, a celebration of all of the fellowship and the gatherings that have been taking place throughout the week. That's why we highly encourage to join a group, get connected in a group. The directory open today. You can text blown group to 94,000. Yes, I got it. Praise God. And be able to, to see, oh, what are the list of groups that are available? And if you say, you know what, I've looked, I don't like any of them. Well, guess what you're doing in the spring season? You lead in the group, the one you like that you can invite other people to be a part of so that you can share your life with others. So get in a group. They will launch next Sunday on the 15th. The greatest way to connect with the Becoming Church is to be in a group. It's not a model that we created. It's not a model that any church, local church you see around here created. It's a model that we see created at the beginning of the church. They met house to house and in the temple courts. So get involved and get connected with the people of God. So church is a people, first observation. Secondly, church is a community. And then here's the last observation. Church is a collaboration. So earlier I mentioned how church is a team sport, and what makes a great team is the ability to collaborate. Now, a team that is collaborative is made up of individuals that are united to achieve the same outcome, to win. If you're an Alabama fan, we got to tell 75, that's how it works, like we're on the same page. Stop, stop holding. When you collaborate... It requires humility to realize it's bigger than me. It requires commitment to say, I'm showing up for the teammate that's beside me. But it also requires a willingness to bring what I have to the field of play. So don't be concerned about, well, do I have enough? You know, a, a, a scripture, a verse that, that really has touched my life is in Matthew 17, where, where uh, Jesus is asked about uh, the, the tax, the temple tax, and, and he tells Peter, like, hey, go reach over into that water, get that fish, and pull out the coins out of its mouth and pay the tax. Because right there, it, it tells me that God will cause the things that should not have what you need to be the very thing that you need. So his resource, his provision, and what he has, it can come from a place that should not be the solution to what you need. So whatever you have, can I tell you, it's enough, and it's enough to be the solution. So don't worry about what you have. Just bring what you have to the field of play. But also, you need a coach who's in the mix reminding, listen, you can do this. And this reminds me of Ephesians 4. 11, verses 11 to 12 that says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, 
the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So it's my job to coach you up. It's my job to pastor you. It's my my job to equip you so that you can do the work of service within this gathering, but also outside this gathering. In fact, in fact, we were talking to a friend recently, and they were talking about how their, their, their office has become their mission field, a way that they can minister and evangelize to their coworkers. Why? Because there's been an equipping in their spiritual journey with Jesus that they've been developed that now they realize that my mission is not just these walls, but that it's outside the walls. That's why we're constant and consistent on that church is a building, but it's a people. But there's this equipping that happens that I can do the work of ministry in here, but I can do the work of ministry out of here. And so then there's this understanding, as Paul talks about, that we are all ministers of reconciliation. So the church isn't meant to be a community, excuse me, the church is meant, rather, to be a community that takes care of itself. And for some of us, can I tell you, now, this rule, that right there, that statement, the church is meant to be a community that takes care of itself. Sounds good. But this will require for some of us to change our approach and to approach it differently. Now, right here, I told the last service, I said, hey, listen, slide your feet back if you need to, okay? Because they might get stepped on, but if they do, you get a pedicure and it'll be all good, but okay, so, so all right, here we go. So, so that, that implies that there's different ways that we approach church. So here it is, all right? Some of us, we approach it with this mindset. We're the critic. I told you, you got to slide them back. Just slide them back and get a pedicure. We are the ones that always, we always have advice. We always have some wisdom to add. But for some reason, we aren't able to execute those ideas. So we just, we're just a critic. How come this? How come that? Why not this? Why not that? Others of us, we're the casual. That, that we participate, but only when it's convenient for us. Some of us, we are the consumers. We are the ones who have the mindset that the gathering is about us. I know Micah and the team They better do my song today because I've been listening to it all week and I just build your church. I just need to hear it. Sing it from the ground. I just need to hear it today. Some of us are like, what happened to the coffee since we left Horizon and came over to JC? That that was mine, actually. That was my bad. I, I don't know how that was me. That was me. That was me. But some of us, we're the consumers. And some of us, we're the contributors. That we're the ones that said, listen, I'm all in. That I'm ready to serve. That we are generous. Not just with time and talent, but treasure. We show up. We participate in the life of the church. Now, hear me. I don't want you to take those approaches as, oh, he's just up there trying to call people out. Absolutely not. It's not my place. It's not my position. I don't want to call out or call up. So that's not what that was about. So don't feel any shame or, or anything because you kind of, we can look at it and say, well, you know, I kind of fit here or whatever. It's not about that. But here's what I'm saying. It's my prayer for all of us to be contributors in the way that that looks like for you in the season of life that you're in, to have a conversation with the Lord and say, Lord, what is it that you would have me to do and being a part of building your church. And can I tell you, it takes you. Sometimes we have the assumption because we see everything and we think it's taken care of. Yes, but no. (laughs) Because the becoming church isn't built on the talents of a few, but by the sacrifices of many. It takes all of us, every man, every woman. Listen, every, every teenager, There are teenagers who who are are running lights. There are teenagers who who are on camera. There are teenagers who are serving and assisting leaders in in becoming kids. So it's being integrated into the life of the church that that it's not something we do. It's it's who 
We are. In fact, after the first, I heard this, sir, I heard, I heard this story after the first service. Someone was saying, hey, I was at a, a, a football game just recently, and there was this moment where somebody was being very, very generous. And there was a comment that was made later. was like, oh, well, you know, she goes to TBC. You know what? And they say, you know what? It makes sense now. Man, them TBC folks are always being generous. Those TBC folks are always looking to go out of their way to help somebody. And then they told me the conversation was like, you know why? Because we just becoming. Now, we're not just trying to have language that's language that we speak, but it's really a way of life that we're trying to get us all activated in, that we are generous because the people of God are generous, because our God so loved the world that he did what? That he gave. And so right there, family, we see that it's not built on the talents of a few, but by the sacrifices of many. In fact, we're going to do this. Maybe, maybe by next week, I'm going I'm to see if we can do this. We're going to get a, a big old sign out in this breezeway that when you come in next Sunday, it's going gonna, it's gonna to say this in Huntsville, in Madison, as it is in heaven. Because can I tell you, that is our heart. Was that a surprise to anybody? That's our heart. We want to impact the Huntsville Metro, that God, we want to see what you can do in this area. What can you do in Meridianville? What can you do in Madison? What can you do in Hampton Cove? What can you do in Jones Valley? What can you do in Athens? What can you do in this city? We're not just trying to get together and be cute on a Sunday and sing Kumbaya, but we want to impact this region and beyond. So if that's this place and that place and that place and that place, Lord, give us impact and reach. But can I tell you, it's not going to happen because of one, two, or three people. It's going to happen because the ecclesia says, I'm stepping out of what I am doing to be a part of what we can do. And from the very beginning, when the Lord just showed us the vision first of this church. We don't own the vision. It's his. And all of us here, we just get to be a part of it. Katie and I just happen to see it first. But it's not, it's not mine. It's not hers. But it's his. And we all get to steward it. But one thing that I felt like the Lord said, that there will come a day and there will come a moment. I get excited just thinking about it. I get humble just thinking about it. That we'll step back and we'll say, look at what the Lord has done and we hadn't gotten there yet. He's been doing things. Lives are being changed. Marriages are being healed. People are being set free. So there's definitely stuff to celebrate. But can I tell you, this is only the beginning. We hadn't even got started yet. But to see it become a reality, family, you got to close your eyes. And you got to see it with me. You got to envision it with me. You got to see it. Close your eyes and see it. That the Lord has positioned us. We are an answer to this city and beyond. We are. And that takes all of us. It takes all of us to step out of what we're doing. To step into what we are doing. It's not an isolated effort. But it's a collaborative one. Because we serve a God with no limits. And while we may have them, listen, he does not. So let's tap into the power of the limitless God. Over these last couple of years of the church, where it will be three in February, it's very, you, you have a hard time telling me something that God can't do. Because I've seen him do miracles in this church from the very beginning. And I'm not talking about things that are just situated with the church, but I'm talking about with the people of the church. I would think back to the pursuit night we had just a couple of weeks ago where we prayed for someone who had been in the hospital for about two weeks and had just gotten out, but things were still shaky. And I got a report that since I showed up that night and worshiped and you prayed with me that my body has awakened. In fact, he said, I cut the grass this week when I couldn't even get out of the bed just last. I'm not talking about just because we moved to this place. I'm talking about what God is doing in the life. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So I'm saying let's go. I'm saying let's ride. And I'm saying let's see what God can do through us. What can he do through you? What can he do through you? What can he do through you?
that we can be a part of something bigger and don't be so concerned about what limitations you feel exist. Give those to God. Limitations in your marriage, give it to God. Limitations in, in your children, give it to God. Limitations in your career, give it to God. Do not accept the answer of no if God hadn't said it. Do not accept the closed door if God wasn't the one who shut it. And don't think because it's shut that it's not a God door. Don't think because it's open that it's a God door. But ask for the discernment. Ask for his, his word. Ask if God, this is you, then walk me through it. Because can I tell you, sometimes an open door is a trap and sometimes a closed door is an opportunity to stand in faith and believe God will make a way out of no way. But don't give up, family. Live with vision. Because I believe this wholeheartedly in Huntsville, in Madison, as it is in heaven. And as Friday morning, I stood up on Blevins Gap and I look over and I see the landscape of the city. I see people that the Lord will give us influence to be able to reach and impact. But it won't be me. It won't be Katie. It won't be the staff. It's going to be us collective as a people. It's going to be your coworkers knowing that they can come to you and you will pray in faith with them. It's your coworker knowing that they can call you when chaos breaks out because you're going to be a person of prayer and peace in the middle of their storm. So what's my response? So we answer what, 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 what church is. It's a people. It's a community. It's a collaboration. But here's my response. My response is to get planted. Psalm 92 says, plant it in the Lord's house. They grow in the courts of our God. That they bear fruit even when they are old. They are filled with vitality and have many leaves. That means through the seasons of life that God is going to sustain you. Through the seasons of life, you're going to see his hand on you. Through the seasons of life, his grace will not just amaze you, but it will sustain you. It will empower you to be all of who he has called and designed you to become. But guess how it happens? By being planted and not being potted. We can pot, we can take a plant out of one pot, put it in another pot. No, get planted. Allow your life to be a seed that's buried. And it may feel dark in that moment, but that's where all the, all the good stuff is happening. That's where the watering is happening. That's where every nutrient that you need is getting. That's where the sun is impacting your life. So one day you sprout up out of the darkness and now you have produced something that is not just beneficial to you, but it's beneficial to others. So when your roots Grow deep, your roots will produce fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. But you got to get planted because it's planted things that grow. Planted things grow. So get planted. If you've been here, get planted. I'm not just selfishly saying this, but get planted here. And I'll say it this way. If it's not here, can I just beg you to get planted somewhere that is healthy and is life-giving because your life will grow there too and it'll get bigger there as well. That's why we say we're not trying to build a big church but build big people but you got to get planted because Jesus, he's not building Fortune 500 companies and he's not building, no, he's building his church which is people. Now you may have one of those companies and it may get to that place but only because you're being built you're getting the wisdom and the guidance and his hand and blessing on it. But he's building his church, which is people. But you got to get planted in the house of the Lord. Come on, let's pray. Father.